Greetings from the other side of the screen and welcome. Welcome to the Sarah and Janet show. The last time you saw us was March 8th when I suggested that we try the live long and prosper hand signal as opposed to handshakes or hugs. That seems like a long time ago now, doesn't it? I was looking at the UUA worship website and found this from Reverend Margaret Weiss. The church is a, the gathering together of all people and the experiences and fear and love and hope in our resilient hearts. Gathering however we can to say to the world, welcome, come in lay down your heartache and pick up hope and love. May be, this be true for you and welcome. Our opening hymn today is Let It Be a Dance. It's number 311 in the great hymnal. We're gonna sing verses one and three. to each other, to the human family, and to the interconnected web of existence by reciting our affirmation together. Please join me. Love is our doctrine. Compassion is our way. Here we seek to create a joyful home for free religious exploration. Build a community of caring fellowship. Nurture the hopes and serve the needs of our world. This chalice is a symbol of our free faith. It burns with an everlasting flame of helpfulness and service and spreads the warmth and light of hope and kindness. At UUCS, we light our chalice for all of those who have joined us today and all of those in our heart. We light our chalice for Shimon Falva, 
uh, for our Shaman Falva Partner Church in Transylvania, Romania, and for the children and youth of the world. Lifespan religious education is still happening. Join the children and family Zoom service each Sunday at 10 a.m. Log on to uusalem.org to find the link. Compassion and gratitude, two practices needed now more than ever. Frequently, we focus on compassion, being compassionate to others, and forget our own need for loving kindness. The more we can practice compassion towards ourselves and gratitude or appreciation for who we are, the more that can overflow into compassion and gratitude in our interactions with others. The more you can be aware of this daily, the more it can become ingrained in you, into your psyche and behavior. I recently saw this poem by John O'Donohue that embodied this idea for me. Here it is. You have traveled too far over false ground. Now your soul has come to take you back. Take refuge in your senses. Open up to all the small miracles you rushed through. Become inclined to watch the way of rain when it falls slow and free. Imitate the habit of twilight, taking time to open the well of color that fostered the brightness of day. Draw alongside the silence of stone until its calmness can claim you. Be excessively gentle with yourself. Let us take a moment to breathe in a sense of compassion and gratitude for our lives. Before you know what kindness really is, you must lose things. Feel the future dissolve in a moment, like salt in a weakened broth. What you held in your hand, what you counted and carefully saved, all this must go, so you know how desolate the landscape can be between the regions of kindness. How you ride and ride, thinking the bus will never stop. The passengers eating maize and chicken will stare out the window forever. Before you learn the tender gravity of kindness, you must travel where the Indian in the white poncho lies dead by the side of the road. You must see how this could be you. He too was someone who journeyed through the night with plans and the simple breath that kept him alive. Before you know kindness as the deepest thing inside, you must know sorrow as the other deepest thing. You must wake up with sorrow. You must speak it till your voice catches the thread of all sorrows and you see the size of the cloth. Then, it is only kindness that makes sense anymore. Only kindness that ties your shoes and sends you out into the day to mail letters and purchase bread. Only kindness 
that raises its head from the crowd of the world to say, it is I you have been looking for, and then goes with you everywhere, like a shadow or a friend. The other day, leaving work, I was focused on getting home and being mindful of the traffic. I realized my lane was stopped because someone was having car trouble. So I got over into the next lane where I could and uh, continued on my way. And just as I passed the car that is stuck, it dawned on me, this person is stuck and needs help. No one is stopping. And here I am just getting out of the way. Why aren't I stopping? By the time this all goes through my head, I am far enough along in another line of traffic where stopping or turning around would have been difficult. So I went along my way, feeling like a bad person and justifying my not stopping by thinking things like, well, well, why didn't they just use their cell phone? Or why didn't they get out and go to the store for help? I didn't know how safe the situation was and what could I really offer it except maybe a ride to the mechanic or, or something when I really didn't know what was the matter. I paid my penance by saying next time I will be more aware when someone needs help and see what I can do to make it better. And then I went on my way, thinking nothing more about it. Soon after, I started noticing how there kept being stories in the newspaper of people who had done something seemingly extraordinary while leading, leading seemingly ordinary lives. Three of the stories occurred before mass media was around, before selfies, Snapchat, and blogs. One story was told only because the recipient of the story thought it should be known. I also met by chance a woman here at a memorial at UUCS who is doing what she can to bring greater understanding and connections to the people of Oregon. If you will indulge me, I'd like to tell you a little bit about these four people. The first one that struck me was about Alter Weiner, 92-year-old man who died December 11th, 2018 in Hillsboro, Oregon, after being struck by a car. He was a Holocaust survivor who, after moving to Oregon in the year 2000, would go to schools to tell his story of persecution. The need to fight prejudice always and everywhere and the courage of everyday people, like the woman who passed him cheese sandwiches daily in a factory where he was forced to work. Her food kept him alive and showed him that even after losing 123 family members in concentration camps, most people are good. He wanted to tell his story so people wouldn't forget how horrible people can act towards each other and how kind. Never forget that there are good people in the world. Then there's the story of six clergymen here in Salem who stood unarmed against an armed, angry mob wanting to attack the Japanese community church in the Labish area on the night of December 7, 1941, after the news that Pearl Harbor had been attacked. The mob wanted to burn the Japs out. But Dr. Knowles, Dr. Pruji, or Pruji, Mr. Bennett, Reverend Harrison, 
and Dr. Nolf all stood side by side and essentially said, you'll have to go through us first. Apparently, Dr. Olds, who was a senior at Willamette University at the time and known for his debating skills, ended his plea with the mob by saying, we are only five that stand here against you. But with everything you know in your hearts and we represent gives the lie to what you are about to do. Men, you'll have to go over us first. And tomorrow, you'll be the sorriest men in Salem. The mob turned back. These brave men did not even get into the newspaper at the time. It was only years later that the story being told by different family members, and because Dr. Olds had become known for his long career in social justice and public service, did the story begin to become public knowledge. In 2003, Willamette University Alumni Magazine had a story about the class of 1942, and this incident was told. By 2006, Olds and everyone else involved was deceased. Dr. Olds became a Methodist minister, as well as being president of two universities, including Kent State University, after the Ohio National Guard shooting of four students protesting the Vietnam War. There was much controversy after the events, and it wouldn't have surprised anyone if Dr. Olds brought in a more conservative approach after the shooting. But instead, he became known as mingling with students who were protesting and supporting their right for free speech. Just standing up and saying no to something can make a difference. And then there's the story of a Salem man who one summer evening stopped his car by the side of a country road because he thought he had heard a sound. Turns out there's an 80 year old woman stuck in her car, which had gone off the road into the middle of an orchard. She had been there for over five hours and likely would not have been found had it not been for this man who had his window down and stopped and responded to a single sound. He got her out of the car and to the hospital for medical treatment. He wanted nothing in return, but she insisted his story be told. A life was saved and a friendship was born because someone was paying attention. The last person I want to tell you about is someone I recently met here at UUCS. Willie Richardson is president of the Oregon Black Pioneers Board. She came here for Mike Swain's memorial service and eloquently spoke, not only about Mike Swain and how she came to know him, but also spoke on the importance of connection with others, with treating each other decently and respecting all individuals. She worked for the Oregon Adult and Family Services and for many years owned a millinery shop here in downtown Salem. She wore a fabulous hat to the memorial, black and white patterned, large rim with a little lace and I believe some black jewels. Oregon Black Pioneers, OBB, OBP, founded in 1993 and headquartered in Salem, is dedicated to preserving and sharing the contributions of African Americans to Oregon history. Richardson has been involved with OBP since 1994. Her goal is, quote, to see the organization continue to move forward 
in its mission of researching the history of African Americans in Oregon, working to ensure that this history is captured and made available to the broader public in accessible forms, such as exhibits, travel tours, virtual museums, etc., and that it is included in the telling of the Oregon story. Willie has also co-authored a book called Perseverance about Blacks in the mid Willamette Valley. It also tells about the very active KKK chapter we had that bullied Catholics, Chinese, and Jews, among others. Someone who is authentic and genuine in her beliefs and actions. All four examples seemed more concerned for the welfare of others than themselves. As Mother Teresa was fond of saying, a life not lived for others is not a life. Well, I don't know that we can all be Mother Teresa, but here are four lives making a difference simply by existing and going about their business. Going back to my own story of finding redemption for my past sin after driving past the car that needed help, a few days later, I had leftovers from lunch in my car and I was at a workshop. And this person asked if there was a vending machine nearby as they hadn't eaten lunch and the workshop was about to start. I explained no, there wasn't, and I offered some of my leftover lunch which was happily received, and I thought nothing more about it. Well, it turns out the person was truly grateful, not just, thank you, that's nice, but effusive about how grateful they were. And for some reason, it seemed surprising to them that I would offer something that was mine to help them at the moment. I thought, wow, they must not get a lot of kindness in their life. Does such a small act of kindness make that much of a difference? And then it hit me. That's what integrity is. It is being enough in the present moment that you can stop and respond to another person without thinking of the benefit to yourself. Or small the act is. What matters is the intent of the action and not expecting some reward for that action. A few days after my lunch incident, I was pulling out of the parking lot of UUCS and I saw a car pulled alongside a cordon road with their lights on. This does not seem to be a safe place to be with cars rushing by and no one was stopping. So I thought, ah, this is karma coming back to me for not stopping the other day to help the person in the car. If I really think this integrity thing is important, I need to be genuine to myself and take the risk to see if I can help. So I went out of here and turned left onto Corden instead of my usual right and pulled up in front of the stranded car. I got out and started walking towards it, and immediately a young teenage boy gets out of the car and starts coming towards me, smiling and saying, it's okay, it's okay, we're fine. And then a woman, his mom, gets out of the car and joins us. We had a nice chat, their car had gotten overheated, and they were waiting to let it cool down, and they were fine. Yes, yes, they had a cell phone, no, no, really. Thanks for stopping, but we're fine. I got back into my car and pulled away. Glad they were safe and okay, but frankly, a little disappointed that my perceived good deed wasn't really necessary. I had shown integrity, hadn't I? Consciously went and had done the right thing, but it wasn't actually needed. So I didn't get that proverbial pat on the back I thought I deserved. But 
wait a minute, wait a minute. Hadn't I just come to the realization that what a life of integrity was is to be enough in the present moment that you can stop and respond to another person without thinking of the benefit to yourself? And here I was wanting a benefit. Yes, I had responded to a situation, but I wasn't thinking of their needs. I was thinking of mine and was disappointed that I couldn't have saved the day more. So maybe that wasn't integrity pushing me to take that action after all. Maybe I was still feeling guilt for not stopping with the earlier car. I needed to remember that integrity is being enough in the present moment that you can stop and respond to another person's needs without thinking of the benefit to yourself. This reminds me of the Buddha monks that go around with their empty bowls and seeing who will feed them. People willingly give them food, but they never look at each other, the receiver or the recipient. They simply give and receive. It is considered a blessing to give and not expect any acknowledgement for your gift. Not even the smile or look of gratitude from a begging monk. Reflecting about the four stories I told and what I admire about them, I'm impressed by their perseverance in championing equality, heroism, stopping and responding to a situation without worrying about how the outcome is going to affect them personally. It was like they lived their lives with integrity, taking the time to be aware of other people, and they had the courage to stand up when they saw injustice being done. That the act of integrity is something that occurs without a person being consciously aware of it. And that it doesn't matter if anyone knows you have done it on social media or not. It is still important and it still makes a difference for someone else and in turn for you. In these days of false news, of the gap between the haves and have nots growing, of drastic environmental changes being compared to mood swings. I need these examples of everyday people doing the best they can with what they have, not for the glory of themselves, but because it is the right way to treat people. It is too easy these days to be stressed by all that is going wrong. They can seem impossible to have any hope for humankind. But these people and, and others act as though they still have hope. UCLA has launched the Verdary Kindness Institute, a place where students can learn what leads to positive social interactions. Mel Harris, who gave money to start this institute, states, we live in a world where it can, easily, it can be easy to be disconnected, focused on what's in it for me. As Lady Gaga says, kindness heals the world. It's what brings us together. It's what keeps us healthy. I wonder, too, when people do kind acts, if they spark the sense of integrity within themselves so that the next time they are more sensitive to a new situation, when a new situation arises and act more instinctually to help. It's like they have Pavlov's dog's bell inside of them, and when it rings, they immediately go, how can I help? There's even a book entitled, How Can I Help? 
written by this strange dude who apparently has the distinction of getting fired from Harvard. Not an easy task. After that, he couldn't find a regular job, so he just started talking a lot and writing. You may have heard of him, Richard Albert, otherwise known as Ramdas. In the book, he writes, caring for one another, we sometimes glimpse an essential quality of our being. We may be sitting alone, lost in self-doubt or self-pity, when the phone rings with a call from a friend who's really depressed. Instinctually, we come out of ourselves just to be there with them and say a few reassuring words. When we're done and a little comfort's been shared, we put down the phone and feel a little more at home with ourselves. We're reminded of who we really are and what we have to offer one another. Much like our own UU principles of inherent worth and dignity and interconnectedness, if we help one, we help all. For we are all in this together. Small acts of kindness, like letting someone go ahead of you at the grocery store, could make a world of difference in that person's life. How is my life going to change from hearing these people's stories? I think trying to be more aware of opportunities when they appear and taking the time to respond the best I can at the moment. I'm reminded at, of the end of Thornton Wilder's play, Our Town. After Emily has died and she goes back to recall one day, her birthday, and as she observes everyone, she realizes how little people really pay attention to one another. They just busily go about their lives from one moment to another until she cries out to the stage manager, do any human beings ever realize life while they live it? The stage manager replies, no. The saints and poets, maybe. They do, some. A life of integrity is the little acts of kindness, one stacked on top of another. One never knows how an act of kindness can make a positive change in someone's life, including your own. Let us take a moment, close our eyes in meditation, and be aware of kindness that occurs in your life. I will ring the bell when it is time to come back. Without kindness and community, our souls cannot thrive, and we cannot become all we are meant to be. Likewise, without the kindness and support of our friends and members, this church cannot thrive. The generosity of our friends and members is the oil that keeps the flame burning bright, that brings light and warmth to our community. Our Share the Plate recipient on fifth Sundays is the Liberal Religious Exploration Fund, which supports and nurtures spiritual growth for all ages. Your contributions can be made by logging onto our website at uusalem.org or by mail. Your generosity, your support, and your kindness are gratefully accepted.
I'm going to light the social justice candle. This candle is kindled from the flame of our community chalice to remind us that the many ministries of this congregation extend support, caring, and kindness to the wider world. And I now extinguish the UUCS chalice. I hope that the warmth and light of its flame burns on in your life until we gather again. May our actions and words be blessings to all whom we touch. May we leave today blessed with questions to direct us toward kindness and hope. May the quality of our lives be our benediction. May we be the keepers of the flame. Our closing hymn today is When I Am Frightened. It's number 1012 in the Teal Hymn. I invite you now to reach out to those you love. If you cannot physically touch them, reach out in your heart. Please join me in saying our closing words. May faith in the spirit of life, hope for the community of earth, and love for the sacred in one another be ours now and in all the days to come.